Hi, and welcome to On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson, and today our special guest is going to be Monsignor Michael Hardiman, who is the pastor of St. Patrick's Parish in Bay Ridge. Monsignor, welcome to the show. Hey, Ed, thanks. Good to see you. Forty years you ordained a priest this year. Forty years. That's, uh, that's a milestone. And uh, l when you were ordained, they did it a little bit differently because the bishop was doing individual ordinations. So you were ordained all by yourself. I was ordained on January 28th, 1978. Before me was Joe Sariello, and before him was Pat Frawley. Mm -hmm. And the reason we decided to get ordained in January, everybody said, you're crazy, the snow, the ice, the weather. We said we were tired of being deacons. <laughs> Who wanted to be a deacon for a full year? Uh. You know, like you were standing next to the priest, and you couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So January 28th, Feast of St. Thomas of uh, Aquinas. Why was it the custom at that point to do those individual, they got away from ordaining people as a class? One of my great uh, role models as a priest was Father Tom McGann. And his answer to that question would have been, ah, uh, somebody read a book. <laughs> so yeah. it what became a current kind of thing in the archdiocese. They were still ordaining a class in Brooklyn Rockville Center. They went for individual ordinations. Part of the thinking was that most people never got a chance to see a priesthood ordination mm -hmm. um, because the, the large, they were large groups and you had a limited number of tickets for family, mostly for family. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened was Bishop Gavro bought the idea because um, he said, yeah, let's see if having more people exposed to ordinations might increase vocations. Mm -hmm. It didn't, <laughs> but it was a good thought. He tried. <laughs> he tried. and. Um, now, where were you ordained? What church? I was sent as a deacon in uh, January 1977 to St. Pius V in South Jamaica. So you were ordained then to the priesthood in that parish? In that church. All right, because uh, that's, that's a little bit different now. You don't go to the co-cathedral, you don't go to the right. cathedral church. And uh, it was one of the poorest parishes in the diocese. Yeah. And it still is one of the poorest parishes in the diocese. Mm -hmm. But I had a great four and a half years there. Were you the only ordination to ever take place there? No. Um, Marty Cull was ordained about two years before me. Okay. And he had been a deacon there. Yeah. What do you remember about ordination day? I remember most that um, there's the part of the ceremony where you uh, lie down on the ground prostrate. prostrate. Mm -hmm. And my mother, who was right next to me in the pew, all of a sudden looks around and says, where's Michael, where's <laughs> Michael? <laughs> so then she looked down and said, what is he doing on the floor? So that's what I remember most. Also, Bishop McGovero, just before we got onto the procession, he took me aside in the dining room and he said, Michael, if you forget everything that you learned in the seminary, forget everything you learned in the seminary, if you remember what I'm going to tell you now, you'll be a successful and happy priest. I said, okay, Bishop, what is it? He said, be nice to the people. And you knew Bishop McGovero, that would be a hallmark of, and now I don't know if he said it to the other guys, I don't know if he picked on me because I wasn't nice to the people, but uh, I've remembered that ever since. You had a special relationship with Bishop McGovero. I mean, uh, you actually lived with him for a long time, didn't you? I lived with him from 81 to 97. Mm -hmm. Well, until his death. Until his death, right. And then, uh, he until died in 91. 91. Right. And then Bishop Daly came in and yeah. we, continued to live there. It was a different kind of well, totally, <laughs> totally, totally different. What was Bishop McGovern like though? I mean, he, he had a lot of likable, everybody loved him. He did. However, I remember at a meeting, we were all around the table. I think we were almost all priests, maybe a couple of nuns and a brother or two. And uh, at one point, there had been discussion for going on for five or six minutes. And Bishop McGovern said, you know, may I suggest, and there was a young priest, younger than I, next to me, who after the bishop finished speaking, he jumped back in as if this was a continuation of discussion. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, no, he just told you what to do. <laughs> that what is, it was his, may I suggest, mm -hmm. it was a polite way of making yeah. decisions. He had a, uh, let's say a very pastoral style, didn't he? Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. And when he went to parishes, he was like that. He would, coming up the aisle, he would work the aisle, so to speak, oh, yeah. say hello yeah. to everybody, yeah. right? His confirmation talk began with, he took off his wristwatch. And then he said, uh, if I gave you this, what would you say? Thank you. They said, all right, now stand up and turn around and thank your parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was the end of the homily <laughs> because he hated preaching. Yes, he wasn't, uh, he didn't give, he wasn't a long-winded no, preacher. No. And, uh, 
I know he would go to bishops' meetings down in Washington or Baltimore, wherever they had them, and, and he wasn't one to get up and make many interventions, you know. No. no. Except that he does get credit for introducing campaign the campaign. Campaign for human development. Yes, he is remembered among them. But what do you think of that style of ordaining people, you know, individually like that and not as a class? Would you, if you were, had your druthers today and you were going to be ordained, which would you choose, knowing what you know? I, I think, having you know, seen both, because we were ordained deacons as a class, so we had both experiences. I would go for the individual priesthood ordinations, really? basically because I think more people get to see mm -hmm. the beautiful ceremony and the moving ceremony that ordination to the priesthood is. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be a little, I mean, it's a long ceremony. And it's going to be a little wearing on the bishop to do that, the 12 back those. He those did 18 days. of them. 18 of them in a year. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. That was a and lot. There was, I think there was two guys who were ordained on the same day. On the day, same day. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we were all, our Rockville Center classmates were ordained either in the morning or the afternoon, and so were we. So many of your classmates were being ordained and running to another ordination. So what happened? We're talking about 18 ordinations, that was 40 years ago. The numbers have dropped off significantly. Yeah. Uh, uh, did they drop off quickly after you were ordained? Mine was the last large class. That was the last large class? Yes. What For, do you think happened? Oh, so much happened. The world <laughs> changed. Um, and, you know, as I'm a child of immigrants, my parents both came from Ireland, um, and I was probably the only kid in my class who was the child of immigrants. So that, that was a whole change. And um, popes beginning with Paul II said, you know, materialism. And materialism was rampant. Um, guys were looking to make a lot of money. And the, the hallmark of success was not what you did with your life, but how much money you made. How, what kind of a car did you drive? There's also the problem with, you hear a lot about commitment, that people were not able to make uh, what they saw as a permanent commitment. I mean, when you make a commitment to priesthood, that's a lifelong commitment. That's a lifelong celibacy. commitment, that's right. Do you think that people of your generation, did you get the feel from your friends and whatnot that they had a problem making that uh, lifelong commitment? A number of guys who were my friends left because they did not want to uh, be celibate for the rest of their lives. I think they would have made great priests, but celibacy was just too much of an obstacle for them. What's the answer to this? I mean, these days, you know, we've, we've, we've had a year for vocations this year in the diocese. And you hear the, some people say, well, you know what? Um, we were never invited to become priests. Nobody ever asked if we wanted to be a priest. Do you think that's a big deal? I mean, that came out of a survey. They, they, they surveyed all these right. young people. They said, we were never asked if we wanted to be So priest. Bishop DeMarzio mentioned that at a pastor's meeting right. years ago. So I took it upon myself. I, I've asked in St. Sebastian and now in St. Patrick, I've asked maybe two dozen young men if they were interested in the priesthood. Oh, two dozen. Two said they'd thought about it. 24 people, two said, yeah, I've thought about it. Well, we're going to come back. We're going to talk about your own decision to become a priest. And while we're into that, you're watching On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson, talking with Monsignor Hardiman. Stay with us. Welcome back to On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson, chatting today with Monsignor Michael Hardiman. So Monsignor, we were talking about what goes into a vocation and uh, the numbers have dropped off significantly, but let's talk about your own idea. When did you first consider or thinking, start thinking about becoming a priest? First grade. <laughs> and I remember it because the teacher was Sister Margaret Agnes and, you know, the went around the classroom saying, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? And everybody was answering. And I said, I want to be a priest. Mm -hmm. And sister managed to tell that to my mother. Again, part of the family lore is sister comes and says, Mrs. Hardiman, Michael wants to be a priest when he grows up. So, um, you know, my mom didn't think anything of it. Then yeah. time went on, time went on. I thought about being other things, um, you know, typical firemen, police, FBI, all those kind of things that everybody else thinks about. Never, never business, never anything like that. That was, you know, nobody's. I probably, if I hadn't gone into the priesthood, I would have followed my father into the company that he worked for, which was the Empire City Subway Company, a wholly owned subsidiary of New York Tell at the time. But I always kept coming back to priesthood. And I went to cathedral prep, and I went to cathedral college, 
Um, then I went to the major seminar. I'm a lifer. You're a lifer. Yeah. I'm a lifer. Mm -hmm. And um, I can also say, I've, I've said it many times, I've never had an unhappy day in the priesthood. Mm -hmm. I've had unhappy hours, unhappy moments, <laughs> but never at the end of the day could I say it was an unhappy day. Mm -hmm. Did the sisters keep the idea of priesthood in front of you as you went through Grand You went to St. Teresa's, Saint Teresa's in, Woodside, in Woodside, right? And, and what kind of sisters were uh, Spark Hill Dominicans. Okay. And um, those were the days they were all in full habit, even before, you know, most of that, none of the modifications or anything. Um, certainly they encouraged us in vocation to the priesthood. In fact, Pat Frawley, whom I mentioned earlier, um, Pat was a classmate of mine from St. Teresa's because St. Raphael's didn't have a school. Wow. So you got two priests out of that class? Uh, actually, we got more uh, because one of our classmates went to the Society of the Divine Word, and there were about four or five who went to the seminary and eventually dropped out. Uh -huh. How about priests in the parish? Were there priests in the parish that were role models to you? Were you an altar server? I was an altar server, and they are, the, all of the priests in the parish were role models I considered at the time. The pastor was Father George Morrow, who most people didn't like. I was going to say he had a very tough reputation, didn't he? Um, I did academically very poorly in Latin and algebra. And you had to go report and that And I to had the to pastor. go to the pastor. And he never said anything other than encouraged. Oh, just do better, just do hmm. better. And he was a professor of Latin at Cathedral College. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I was expecting to get creamed. Yeah. Never happened. Yeah. Now, when you went to Cathedral Prep, uh, was it mostly priests still on the Almost faculty? all priests. Yeah. Almost all priests. And what was that group of men like? And, and they were extraordinary men. Ex well, you know. Yeah. Um, they were extraordinary men. And the time with them was, you know, you, you felt a camaraderie, almost a brotherhood. We were the little brothers. They were the older guys. Yeah. Um, some of them I mentioned, Tom again before. Tom was a, a great role model. Um, he died too young. Um, Father Ed Troike, oh, another one. Yeah, yeah. Um, Monsignor George Fogarty was the, the rector at the time. And uh, then Father John Egan, whom I succeeded yes, as pastor right. at uh, St. Sebastian's, uh, ultimately. Yeah. Uh, they were all great guys. And did you stay involved in the parish while you were in high school also? Yeah, I was, yeah. I was the... Uh, president of the parish council when I, when I was in college, I think. Uh -huh, First uh -huh. year in college. Uh -huh. yeah. Now you went away, you went to Douglaston and that was a live away, right? And that was a live away, yeah. yeah. And what was that experience like for you? I mean, you were, you were an only child, you were the only one at home. Yep. Did your parents buck the idea at all? That no, you, they never, they were always encouraging. They said, whatever you do, as long as you're happy. Uh -huh. And they always said, if you want to come out, you know, just come out. If you don't want to go on, don't go on. And. I had no intention of not doing it. Did you ever have any doubts? Uh, not really. No. I knew it was what I wanted. I might have wanted some other things as well. I might have wanted a family, but I was willing to sacrifice that for what, what I thought was a greater good. But you know, I, I think back to my years in the seminary, I remember uh, I was a reserve chaplain. Um, we did hospital ministry. Uh, I did prison ministry for a little while with uh, Monsignor Fulham. Um, and so I had a chance to do so many different things. And um, then, you know, um, the parish kept really uh, kept me where I level and, and where I wanted to be. Did you have a pastoral year when you were out in Huntington? Not a pastoral year. We had a deacon year. Okay. So we were ordained deacons in January of 77. and. Any time after January of 78, we could or petition to be ordained. Okay. And as you mentioned before, you were sent to St. Pius V to do your uh, diaconate work. And as you said, it was a fairly poor parish. Very poor. Yes. One of the poorest in the diocese. We had a school. It was a struggling school. While I was there, the school caught on fire. Um, we rebuilt it. Um, not rebuilt it from the ground up, but we repaired it and did all of that kind of stuff. So how did that year at St. Pius help you discern your vocation? I mean, you were pretty well set for what you've been telling us. You were set on you were going to be, become it, a priest. It affirmed my vocation. Um, Pius V was a completely diverse parish. It was um, about 30% African American. It was 30% Portuguese immigrants, Portuguese immigrants. Um, and then there was 20% Latinos, and then the rest 
um, was everybody else. Uh, and we had mass in Spanish, English, and Portuguese every Sunday. And after I was ordained a priest, I wound up celebrating mass bilingual, my idea. Let's do bilingual Spanish, Italian. Uh -huh. Crazy, <laughs> crazy. Um, then they taught me enough Portuguese that I could celebrate mass in Portuguese and then preach in Spanish. And the, the languages are very close. You mentioned that while you were in Huntington, you also did this uh, naval chaplaincy. Uh, uh, what was that like? Where did you have to go? Did you have to go somewhere? And... I went to chaplain school in Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And then um, we did two weeks act, act dutra, active duty for training. Um, and I went to Portsmouth Naval Hospital, went to a couple of the sub bases in New London. Uh, great experiences. What did you learn from that? What did I learn from that? I learned that one of the things that a priest has to do is be flexible and to adapt himself to different situations and not, uh, not w without very much thought to it. You have to go from one thing to another. So, um, and I, I love being a chaplain, uh, even if it was just the reserves, but mm -hmm. I got out of it when I went into education in 1981. Mm -hmm. So on the day that you were ordained, did you feel pretty well prepared? I mean, theologically, pastorally? Oh, yeah. uh, Huntington uh, was a great seminary, mm -hmm. um, great learning experience, as was Douglaston. Mm -hmm. uh, four happiest years of my life were in Douglaston. Mm -hmm. um, Huntington learned a lot. Um, couldn't really wait to get out. Uh, most of the class would tell you, you know, like we were anxious to be ordained. And as I mentioned earlier, that's why we got ordained in January, because who wants to be a deacon when you can be a priest? Um, so uh, yeah, great. And, and Pius was a great experience. I was there for, including the year of deacon, I was there for four and a half years. In the next segment, we're going to talk about what you've done with your priesthood and the many different roles that you've had. You're watching On the Block, and we're going to come right back with Monsignor Michael Hardiman. Welcome back to On the Block. I'm Ed. This is Monsignor Mike, and uh, we've been talking about your preparations for priesthood. And, and now you're ordained, and your first assignment was? St. Pius V, South Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I was there for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. You have filled a number of different administrative roles as well as parish roles. You were assigned to the Office of Catholic Education. And you yes. worked over there with Monsignor, later Bishop Breen, right? Yep. Uh, what were your duties there when you worked at the uh, education office? Well, I'll tell you the story of how this happened. I had gotten a call in 1980 from Monsignor John Lavin uh, back in the spring and asking me if I would celebrate what I would preach at the McIntaggart Mass, which was the September ma Mass for deceased bishop. And I said, I really didn't know the man. He said, no, 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 you just get an opportunity to talk about priesthood and everything like that. So lo and behold, it turns out that was an audition. So um, I'm there, and shortly after the McIntyre Mass, where I had preached, um, I got a phone call, would you come in and see the bishop? So I went in, Bishop McGovern said, again, you can never forget his words, thank you for accepting our appointment <laughs> to the Office of Catholic Education. Yes. <laughs> it, um, and that was part of his, he was the Prince Bishop. I mean, the last of them, but he was a Prince Bishop. So I went into education June of 1981. I was just shy of 30 years of age. And because I started June 1st and I, my birthday was June 3rd. Um, and I stayed in education. I started off as an assistant to Brother Medard Shea, God rest his soul, great teacher. One of the best teachers that I had. Um, because my background was not in terms of education, curriculum, or any of those kind of supervision. Uh, my background was planning and public policy. And I had gone to NYU, I got a degree in um, public policy, um, master's of public administration kind of degree. And um, so I kind of went up the ranks and finally I was the deputy superintendent mm -hmm. under uh, Monsignor Breen. Right. And one of the things that you coordinated was what we call at the time the Convey Report. Uh, you remember that, and oh, th yeah. th that talked about the future of Catholic schools and what we had to do, or what they were recommendations to preserve the Catholic school system. It did. Uh, what were some of the things that you remember it recommending, and uh, uh, was it was it taken seriously at the time? Do you think? Uh, well, this is the church, Ed. 
you, you've worked for the church yeah. long enough. That's a long view. Right? Yeah. Well, what, what happened was that um, Bishop Daly asked me at the end of the Convey project, he asked me to uh, run the synod for him. Right. And uh, so the Convey report was not finalized until October. And I started the synod in September, started working on the synod uh, in September. And um, so my successor had no skin in the game with regard to the convey study. So it really did not get implemented. And I remember when Bishop um, DiMarzio came to the diocese and he, he was big for you don't have any plans, you don't have any policies, you don't have any regulations. And he came to St. Sebastian Rectory and I, on, on the coffee table were, was the convey study and then the policies that went along with it. Um, that's when, and the biggest thing that we didn't do at the time was implement the, the biggest recommendation which was to have a $100 million endowment for the purpose of supporting Catholic education. We didn't do that at the time. Uh, if we had taken that seriously, I think when Bishop DiMarzio arrived on the scene, it would be a di completely different uh, experience. Well, he picked up on that recommendation. He picked up on it and um, we tried. Mm -hmm. And it was not, not easy because it was 10 years later and everybody else's oar was in the water by then. Sure, yeah. And you mentioned you also coordinated the Synod. Uh, what were some of the things that you think came out of the Synod that... Uh... The Seventh Diocesan Synod was just an incredible experience. We had 500 people come out five different times over the course of a year and a half. Um, all of the majority of them were lay people. A small portion of sisters, brothers, and priests, but the majority were lay people. Um, I had 50 groups because it was 500 people, 10 people to a group. Um, people became friends, lifelong friends uh, thereafter. And one example of that would be the late Bishop Joe Sullivan was in a group with Dr. Elizabeth Lutash, who was a parishioner of St. Teresa's in Woodside, whom I did not know. So uh, Dr. Lutash and Bishop Sullivan became friends, um, and she became heavily involved in Catholic charities. And there's, in fact, a, a center that's named after her uh, in Brooklyn. Another one of your assignments was you became the, uh, the director of Immaculate Conception Center in Douglas. I think the first director, right? No, no. no? Um, first director was Monsignor jo Joan Nagel. Oh, that's right, Monsignor Nagel, okay. Who but I succeeded in St. Patrick's just as I succeeded <laughs> him in Douglas. Uh -huh. And Monsignor Nagel, and I know you carried on, you had a real spirit of hospitality out there. Yes. Uh, what was your concept of what the center should be at that time? Because it, it was built as a four-year college, as we know, and we both benefited from the education there. But uh, what was your concept then of the new building as a, a pastoral center? Once it became a pastoral center, it had to be a welcoming place. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Father Harold Buckley. Yeah, sure. And he designed that statue, statue mm -hmm. which was called the Welcoming Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, that was what, it should be a place of hospitality, both for the retired priests and for the student residents and everybody else. And we had a large contingent of diocesan employees there as well. So we had lunch. One of the things that I did bring in was a uh, priest. Uh, once a year, we had a, a priest dinner around the Feast of All Saints. And all of the retired guys were able to invite two or three people. And the resident priest could invite two or three people. And I invited 25 people. <laughs> and it was nice. We did it every year. Um, I think the financial crisis, ultimately, that was a casualty of it. But that was after my time. Mm -hmm. We're running short on time, but I, wanna, I want you to comment on how have all of these experiences, uh, administrative experiences, how did they help you eventually uh, in your assignments as a pastor because you were at 12 years at the St. Sebastian's and now you're at St. Patrick's in Bay Ridge, two big parishes. How did all that experience help you to be a pastor? It helped me because I, I had been doing budgets. Uh, I was experienced with taking care of buildings. I had a swimming pool at St. Sebastian's just like I had a swimming pool at the IC Center. Um, they, it was good preparation. Most pastors don't have a lot of, or most priests who become pastors don't have a lot of experience with budgeting and budgets. That was what I was doing from the time I went into the education office uh, and all through. 
I mean, we did a lot of work at the IC Center. Uh, we painted the chapel. We put a new gilding on, on the, the cross on the roof. We did all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So I, I look and I say, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then I say, I don't want to, how, how much longer I'm going to do this part of it. Because uh -huh. um, the administration is uh, a burden. Mm -hmm. It really is. But you've, uh, you've been able to remain happy uh, in, in your priesthood, and uh, that's evident, I think, you gotta be happy. today. You've got to be happy, you've got to be holy, and you've got to be a whole person, W-H-O-L-E. And, and uh, all of my experiences, I think, dovetail and contribute to my happiness, my wholeness, mm -hmm. and my holiness. Great. Thanks for sharing your ministry with us today. We've been talking with Monsignor Michael Hardiman here on the block, and Thanks to him for being with us and thank you for joining us today. We'll see you again next time. Thanks, Ed.